the last time, I want you to think about the last time you started a new, a new job. When was the last time you started a new job? You remember that, that process and that, that journey, the beginning of that? At most jobs, at least at, at jobs with good bosses, you're going to start your job with a pretty clear idea of what you're going to be doing. Okay? And some of you are like, eh, that wasn't my boss. But, you know, you understand the idea that we start our, our jobs with a pretty good idea of kind of what our days are going to look like, what our days are going to be filled up with, how we're going to spend our time, the peripheral things we're going to do alongside the, the main things we're going to do. And because a lot of that comes in what we call a job description, right? We, we've seen a lot of those. Uh, you get a job description, tells you these are your tasks, these are your responsibilities. Um, and, and so, th- we, we appreciate those and we can look to those because we know, okay, if I ever get lost thinking I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to be doing, I can always go back to that and always go back to the job description and say, okay, refresh my mind uh, on, on what actually is going on. Uh, with my days and how I can how I can form my day. So, the, the the issue that we find here today, and when I say here, what I really am talking about is is culture today, is that a lot of people are kind of looking for what am I supposed to be doing just with my life, and we kind of we we kind of wish there was just a really great job description. Now, this would be maybe an easy thing to say, well, the Bible is our job description, and yeah, okay, and you wouldn't be wrong about that. That's, that's the way we could go with this, but, but we do struggle with that, and especially people who, who don't have, maybe don't have Christ in their life and don't look to the Bible. Um, lots of people really struggling right now with, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing here? What, what should my days really look like? Um, and so, the the word we get down to and the idea we get down to is what are you supposed to do? What were you, what were you born to do? You've heard that. I was born to do this. What were you born to do? Have you ever heard somebody say that and you think, I'm glad you know what, I, what you were born for. I'm not quite sure yet. Um, I, I do that every time I hear somebody say, I was born to do this. Well, I'm glad you found yours. Um, but, but it also comes down to this word, that we're going we're gonna to try to get to a little bit of the bottom of. It's a deep word, uh, just the word purpose. Uh, what is our purpose? And so, let that word kind of rattle around in your mind for a little bit. Uh, I want to introduce to you guys our guest for tonight. Uh, our guest for tonight is, uh, is somebody who I look up to uh, as a as a peer, as a friend, but also somebody that I, I have a lot of respect for um, in the way he has uh, lived his life and the way he has impacted others and the way he seeks for his life to be an impact to others uh, all the time. Uh, and he used to actually spend a little bit of time around here. So let me introduce to you guys, let's bring out Brother David Skidmore. Hello. Welcome. Good well, to see you. Have a seat, Dave. Well, glad you're here. Say say hello to everybody. You know, I, I know you know oh, hey. one or two people out there. I see um, Booker. I, I see you, Marie. you know my wife back there. She's she's waving at you. You may or may not have a sister in the audience. Um, and so right you know, there, yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Hey, hey. Brother in law. Brother in law. There you go. Shout hey, out. Hey, all right. There you go. Okay, so Dave, what we're really all really wanting to know tonight, and I think you might be able to help us out with this. Do the Thunder have any chance of keeping Russell Westbrook? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, Russ, is, Russ is gone. If you're... Seriously? Uh, yes, Russ is gone. And, and it's okay. Uh, mourn, grieve, do what you need to, but uh, yeah, that, that ship has sailed, and uh, I believe that it's going to end up in Miami. I think it would be the most Russ thing he could possibly do after all this is to be like, no, I'm staying. That'd be very. That'd be rust. the most rust thing he could possibly Especially if Sam trades him, and, and then he's Russ like, says, no. "No, I'm still not. Yeah, <laughs> I block it." Yeah, yeah. 
Well, they're not feeling this. By this, by the way, this is this is how Kevin and I usually talk. Yeah. Uh, if we're just talking, so uh, you're getting an actual conversation that that we have Booker. So welcome, uh, welcome anyway, in. Yeah. Welcome into our conversation. Yeah. And we're just gonna we'll just keep uh, this kind of conversation going. We'll we'll leave uh, Russ on the back burner for now. If you want to talk more about Russ later. Uh, I'd love to talk about it. I'm a little bit bitter. Dave is a, a good sports resource for you. Um, but Dave, so a lot of us know you, love you. Some of us don't know you at all. Um, but but you've, you used to be around here a lot, and you're not around here as much anymore. Uh, give us a little bit of update and just where's Dave been? Uh, what have you been up to lately? Eating way too much fast food. Well, sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> Tough crowd tonight, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yesterday was dressed like a cow day, cow appreciation day at Chick-fil-A. And uh, of course you... Did anybody else? Anybody else dress like a cow and go We're to We're looking Chick-fil-A. for a little audience participation. Anyway, no, so nothing. I've been... Nothing tonight, Yeah, Dave. Chick-fil-A. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, so a, a few years ago, I moved to Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. And so um, that was in 2016. Sure. And so when, when I moved to, to Oklahoma City, uh, I had been working with Contact, but before that, I was a creative storyteller for them. And so uh, a lot of the things that, that I was doing with story, uh, and then I, I, I translated that into just doing my, my own business. So I was clarif- uh, helping leaders clarify on, on their message, and then I did leadership development. I uh, did that for about two and a half years. And okay, then, let me pause you for just a second. Yeah. You are a creative storyteller yes. for a church, and then for you helped other people. Yes. Um, give us a little, because that, that sounds like, um, it could potentially sound like what you might just do just just like for fun. So how is that, how does that translate into the professional world? Yeah, it turns out that it actually is a lot of fun for me. Like It's I, I a love, huge deal yeah. now that a lot of companies are trying to do. So tell yes. us what that looks like. Yeah, so uh, one of my favorite quotes comes from Steve Jobs, and Steve said that, that um, Oh, I like to say Steve as if we're, we're buddies. Uh, buddies. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so Steve, uh, Steve Jobs said uh, that in in a culture, the most powerful person is the storyteller because story shapes uh, how we see things and how we experience life and and really uh, how we view things going forward. And so. Uh, what what I did in, in working with businesses uh, with w- within the framework of story uh, was really help them clarify first of all what is your message because a lot of them couldn't explain what they did uh, and so very succinctly uh, explaining their message and then how that could actually engage somebody uh, to live a powerful story through that so sometimes that would be uh, you know somebody who worked in sales uh, and maybe. They uh, m- maybe some of, of their clients uh, had a big fear, and so we needed to address what, what some of those fears were uh, to, to dig a little bit deeper into that. Uh, sometimes um, people didn't really, they, they couldn't see the, the significance of their own story, which ironically is going to be part of what, what we're talking about tonight. And so mm-hmm. when you can look on a big canvas and see uh, where you've come from and some of the obstacles that, that you've overcome, uh, that, that can also position and help you be poised for your next steps in the future. Um, and so basically that, yeah, story was, was part of it. Yeah. Uh, out of that, I help people kind of cre- create a framework for some of the stories that they were living in, in their lives. And, and some of the times that was stories that they were telling themselves about their life that ne- wasn't necessarily true. I think, uh, I'll go ahead. Any you give us a little example of what that looked like? Are you able to share any of that stuff? I, yeah, did, I just I, sprung this on you, but... Yeah, so I, I think like, like a good example is, um, so growing up, um, Jessica and I have, have another sister. Uh, her name's Trisha, and Trisha is, is the middle sister, and we referred to her as the smart sister. Um, 27 on the ACT, um, you know, that's like way above my, my pay grade. And so what, what I kind of got on the other side was if she's the, the smart sister, which I began just saying as a compliment, but what, what I began to believe about myself is if she's the smart sister, then maybe I'm the sibling in the house who's not so smart. And so it's something that, that I carried with me through a lot of my life. Uh, and I, I can remember, Kevin, like I was, I was in a leadership group a few years ago and uh, one of our friends, Dr. Nathan Meller, was, mm-hmm. was speaking at it. And w- one of the lessons that, that I got there was you don't have to be the smartest person in the room to make a difference. And so I would often sit with these people who I knew were way smarter than I was. Um, but I found that, like, if I, if I could take a step forward in, in the conversation, 
um, if, if I was willing to maybe risk a little bit of where I've been and some of my struggles, that it would invite them forward in that. So uh, two things on that was, was, was sharing that with people, sharing some of my stories. But the other part of it that was really significant, uh, I think, is replacing uh, false narratives that I've believed replacing stories that aren't true in my life uh, with stories of how God actually sees me. And so I, I, I believe that when people start to embrace truth about their life, uh, they begin to not just um, start enjoying life more, but they begin to impact other lives a lot more as well. Uh, another friend of yep. ours, Phil Brookman, uh, a yeah. real close friend of mine, who will actually be here uh, later this summer, um, he in coming up with a lot of really good questions for, for a project he's working on, uh, shared this with me. Uh, just a question for people to think about and, and, and allow this question to shape what's going on. What is the story you most, tell your, most often tell yourself about your surroundings, and what is that story costing you? Mm. Uh, which is something that, that continues to, to kind of wreck me and change a lot of the ways I think about stuff. Um, so, Let's get back to, so this is, that's what you yeah. did for a little bit, and you, you started your own business and did that for a couple of years, and then yes. what came next? Well, the thing that I didn't understand going into that time, um, I, I didn't take a business class in college, and so I didn't understand, one, how hard it was going to be, and two, uh, I, I didn't get like a good runway on it, and so um, I had a mentor in, in my life, another friend of ours, Frank Smith, yeah. and, and yeah. I had been meeting with him for about two years. At that point, we met probably once every two weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a business owner and business coach in, in, in Oklahoma City, and uh, he, has, he has a fantastic company uh, along with Nathan Meller, uh, a, a few companies, but I asked Frank if, if uh, I just said, what, what would it look like if I joined your, your team at Mosaic Personnel as a recruiter, and he said, are you interested in, in going to the staffing industry, and I I knew, like, long-term, I actually didn't know if I'd want to be in staffing. I don't know if anybody's done recruiting in here. Uh, when I looked at it, I, I said, I don't know. Like, I'm curious to find out. But what I do know is I want to be around this kind of a healthy culture. And I've seen the types of values. I've, I've seen the values you have um, that, that Nathan has. And um, with what you guys teach out in, in the marketplace, I would like to experience that. And I also know that in a few years from now, um, that if I'm better on the phones, which are going to be as um, like in, in the recruiting world, mm -hmm. if I'm better uh, on, on the phones, if I'm more organized, like if, if I've just focused on some of these things, no matter what I'm doing, it's going to pay off well. So my, my focus wasn't so much what's the job I'm going to do next, um, at that point of, of my life, if I can, since you said, where, where were you? I'll actually kind of give you sure. like a, a big overview. And that is uh, in 2016, as uh, quite a few of you know, um, my mom passed away. And so uh, when I moved to Oklahoma City, I didn't recognize what it would look like at that time to be starting a business while grieving. And I, I hit a point after two years and I realized that there were things in my life that I just needed to like slow down, like I needed to hit the, the stop button. And I had a, I had a business, uh, a, 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 another mentor in business who said to me, a lot of you young guys think that you need to peak in your life at 35. Like that's where you're going to peak. And that's not true. Like your, your peak influence is going to be in your 60s and 70s. Um, so like you need to build towards that. You need to, to be thinking about that. So if you took the pressure off now, what would you do? And I was like, I would close my business today. I was exhausted. And um, that, that gave me time as well to, to just, um, I, you know, I went to, to counseling, um, took a lot of time to, to do introspection and reflection and really try to, to just go to a, um, even a healthier place with God during that. And, um, you know, I was planning on being at, at Mosaic for a few years um, but then God opened the, the door and invited me just recently um, to join this, uh, this really cool network in Oklahoma City. It's a leadership group called SALT, SALT and Light Leadership Training, which is, 
ironically, <laughs> where I learned that lesson that you don't have to be the smartest person in the room to make a difference. Uh, and so I'm their creative director now, storytelling, mm -hmm. uh, and doing a lot of other things. So I hope like in the coming year, we'll have some really cool things to be able to, to share uh, with the family here at Park Plaza and many other things. Excuse me, the, the park. The park. Uh, you, get, you, you gotta put your, your <laughs> quarter in the, in the plaza jar. What do we Man. call that? Y'all yeah. do that? Yeah, there's. there's <laughs> Y'all are gonna get rich on a, that. Like a, if anybody else says it like like me, there's a proverbial <laughs> plaza jar around here that, yeah. that Brett has a lot of money in right now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, love uh, it. So good to see you, Brett. So uh, a lot of us have gone through job changes, mm. um, such as such as you have, and yeah. you seem to be surrounded by by good people, mm. um, but. But you did something I think that was really, really smart, which is take a breath mm. <laughs> uh, and and do a little bit of inspection and, and counseling and talking to other people, getting yeah. some wisdom. What were some of the things that you learned, maybe even about yourself, through that process that that led you to a, maybe a healthier spot mm. uh, here today? Yeah. So uh, a lot of my worldview, a lot of how um, my framework works, uh, is is that. I view my life essentially through the word do or through achievement. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting for me because, you know, some, some of you are, are like this out there and, and you like building something, you like helping something like really flourish and, and grow and, and, and you like bringing your, your skills to, to the table in, in that way and you really measure your, your life like, like I do in that. And so um, I think part of that is just God's design, but the other side is that there, th that there can be a really dark side to, to that, and that's, um, you can kind of, you can kind of start viewing your world just simply in terms of accomplishment and achievement, and you're not a person. Are you with me on this? Mm -hmm. So, for, for me, that was one of my big things is, is to slow down, and, and I feel like God's kind of done this in, in different points with different people, um, but I felt like, like so when, when I was running a business, I would say to people, uh, they'd say, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm in leadership development and brand strategy, and I, I help companies tell, tell their stories. And I would have people lean forward and say, like, I always wish I had the courage to step out and do my own thing. And I was like, oh. The other side is that you might end up exhausted <laughs> by, you know, running your own business and being by, by yourself in it and just trying to make it on, on your own. And so what, you know, for, for me, that was actually something that just kept me going. That has nothing to do with bottom line actual success in life. But how people talk to me felt so good in those moments that I would keep going even though I knew that like I wasn't building for long-term success. Mm. So when, when I uh, met somebody two weeks after I had closed my, my business and I had just started th this new job, I said, they, they said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a recruiter. And they said, oh, and they looked the other way <laughs> because they know that recruiters are like, can I get you a job today? And... Um, <laughs> I think recruiting is amazing, by the way. If you're a recruiter, I think it's, it's a really cool job. What I ran into in, in that experience, though, was that the way, uh, like, people didn't talk to me in the same way. And, the th like, a lot of the things that I was holding on to, like speaking engagements or other stuff, like, God just shut so much stuff down. And it was like, we're just going to kind of deal with the fact that, like, when you don't have these things, like, your identity gets a little wonky. And so, for, for me, that was, that was a, a really huge deal. I had just gone through a breakup at that time as mm -hmm. well. I mean, mm -hmm. just kind of like, like, who am I in a relationship? Yeah. Like, what are my values? Like, how do I go about? And, like, I, I come from, from a family with values and principles, but, I mean, like, like even values like, do, will I speak up and have a harder conversation? <laughs> or will I, you know... Do I avoid difficult conversations? Yeah. Some things that, frankly, I mean, like some of you may have worked through a long time ago, but things that I kind of danced around and had the courtesy to, to, to move around because um, when you go on a stage, when you speak at places, when you're in the limelight in that way, um, and, I, you know, it wasn't like on huge stages or anything at that time, but it was, it was just interesting. People talked to me differently. 
And once they stopped, it was like, oh, now I just have to deal with the dysfunction inside of me. And I think that that was one of the greatest things that God could give me is an interruption and a reset button for that. Yeah, yeah I've, I've talked with a number of people who, who identify themselves in a certain way yeah. based off of career or income mm-hmm. or, or yeah. even hobby. And then all sorts of life circumstances yeah. can take those things away very quickly. Uh, and so when, when that gets taken away, where are you? Where mm-hmm. are you left? And so we're, I feel like we're all sort of on this journey. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, th- I feel like a lot of us can relate to, to some of the things you're saying. And as far as understanding just kind of the inner, inner some of the inner tor- turmoil and also inner growth going on mm-hmm. uh, during transition, and we're all wanting to live a life that has meaning, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we all want a life that, that has meaning and that has this, you know, this $100 word that we're using tonight, the word purpose. We want a life that is full of purpose. If I can, if I can wake up in the morning and I know if I have a really good idea of what my purpose is, boy, I'm bouncing out of bed. Uh, but without that, mm. boy, that's hard. But it's also a journey. It's a process to get to understand what that is. So if... Could you let us in on, because of all the storytelling, I almost said it a minute ago, yeah, yeah. the idea of telling your story and helping people understand what they're supposed to be doing and why they're doing it. I mean, the word purpose is all over that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, the, the journey that you've had um, and, and even the, the careers and just the passion that you have to help people, help us, help us understand a little bit about maybe the process of coming to understand your purpose. Does that question make sense? Is that, yeah, is that good? Does that question make sense to you guys? Not just, not just how, do you, how am I there, but how do you get there? Because I, I don't always feel like I'm there and I have an understanding of what my purpose is. So hmm. wh- what's a, what, what words do you have about just understanding how to get to your purpose? Yeah, the, the process of getting to your purpose, I think sometimes uh, is elusive right? Yeah. We, we kind of talked about that. Yeah. Like you can, it can feel like you're chasing your purpose. I hear people talk about that a lot. Like if I could just get to knowing what my purpose is. And first of all, we have to dial it back a little bit. Like Isaiah, God clearly says there, like I created you for my glory. <laughs> There's your purpose. So like just baseline, <laughs> like if we're wondering why I'm here, like that's it is like to make God look beautiful and wonderful as he is. Um, and so even if there wasn't like another manuscript about purpose out there, that I think is sufficient uh, for us. And yet there is more. I think that, that he gives us more, that he invites us in, into more resources. And so um, one thing is, um, I, I, I actually, I feel very purposeful in life and how I go about it. Um, and I think part of that is, the prayers that were prayed for me. Yeah, go on, like, say more about that. Yeah, like, okay, so um, when I went to college, my mom prayed one prayer that I know of consistently. I'm sure that, that there were a lot, but she just asked God to give me mentors. And mentors really helped align me in my purpose because it gave me people uh, who would tell me the truth, they weren't really impressed by me at all. And so, uh, like, we, we kind of took that off, off the table. Um, and the more that they got to know me, I think that the less that they were impressed. But I mean, like, like you know, I, God just kind of blessed me with these really significant mentors. I, and I almost feel like I kind of fell into some of that. So I'm saying that there's a tension between, like, I feel very purposeful, and yet that really... My, my sense is that so much of that has come from the prayers that others have prayed on my behalf. So if, I think if you're looking for your purpose, James clearly says, like, if any of you is lacking wisdom, you should ask God. And he gives generously without finding fault. But when you ask, like, you must believe and not doubt. So, like, really bank on it, really believe him and trust him and don't expect, like, I mean, maybe you, you can raise your, your expectation that God's just going to give you a light bulb moment, but most of my life, it hasn't come through light, light bulb moments. In fact, my purpose has been refined more by pain. 
So like um, one of my favorite quotes uh, comes from Nathan Meller, and that is, the price of great character is pain. Mm -hmm. And so like if you have purpose, but you don't have character, like you, you like I, I don't think you, you can actually like divorce those two. Like yeah. that those, those have to come together. But then um, if I was saying like just, just one other thing, um, but before we, yeah, we kind of move, move forward, I, I would say um, that purpose is often the idea of a place. Like I'm trying to get somewhere. Yeah, like I'll get to my purpose. And like when I get to my purpose, then everything makes sense. So I'll stay there, and yeah. camp there, and be there forever. Yeah, like, like yeah. I, can, I can arrive at my purpose, and yet it looks to me, so I, I've been thinking about this. Th this comes fr from an idea, if you're familiar with the idea of breakthrough. And whether you call it breakthrough or something else, I believe this is an idea that our culture is currently obsessed with. Like, if I can just get to my breakthrough, then things work out. And this is just simply when I, then I mindset, right? So, like, when I get a, when, when I get a bigger bank account, <laughs> then things actually, like, becomes, like, a, a little more peaceful. Like, when, when I get into that relationship, then things are going to be good. When they understand me, then we're going to be able to move forward. So, there's a when I and then uh, then I. So, like... We can kind of live in between that space for a really long time, but James doesn't so much give us a when I, then I mentality, um, and, and he doesn't really talk to us about breakthrough either. Um, instead, he says, um, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith produces perseverance, perseverance, like let perseverance finish its work so that you'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So that idea to, to me says that like, like breakthrough gets me to a place, but God wants to give you perseverance, maturity, and wisdom because that will give you seasoning for every place you go. That will give you strength for every place you go. So it's not so much about the place that I am, it's the God that I serve in the process and the purpose is reflecting him where I am. Are you, does that make, man, Booker, I, I miss you shouting me down so much, man. We used to have so much fun in the, in the college group, you know, the happy clappers. Okay, let's come we're back gonna, to we're it. We're going to have to rein in. Love you, brother. Gonna, Dave's going to start preaching here in a minute if we don't kind of bring it back a little bit. So, so much for Q&A. So much for Q&A. I'm just going to step off the stage here in a minute and let you, <laughs> let you run. Um, no, I, I, I really, really like that, um, the idea that, that we're not... It's not about getting to a place, um, because who who in here um, over the age of six um, has has felt like their purpose has always been the same throughout their entire life? In every season of life, their purpose has been the same. But we still feel like we have to get to our purpose. Like it, it we contradict ourselves so much. Um, and so I love the idea of, of finding, so, so maybe purpose is at, le at, least, at least part of our purpose. It sounds like it should be our whole purpose maybe, but, but found in knowing the God that's traveling with you. Yes. What, one idea of purpose is what am I doing? I think that the, the idea of purpose from God's perspective is not just what am I doing, it's who am I becoming? Because... That's the process of transformation. And Jesus is always inviting us to walk with him closer. So it's not, it's not just some, like, you can kind of idolize being in that right job. I know that I have. Um, being in a place where maybe it won't be as frustrating, but it's often, like, in that space where, where you know, you're getting stronger in the moment. Uh, it's when your boss is frustrating you most that you're learning patience most, right? So it, we, we want to become all that God has for us. Um, and, and so another factor in, in purpose, I think, has everything to do with how we see God and who he is. Uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the ideas is that, like, as this church, by the way, this is an amazing church, uh, I think that today in culture, there's a narrative that, like, the church isn't really robust. One thing that I love about um, the park. Uh, Good job. Well done. It, yeah, okay. thank you. 
no money to the jar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, Cecil. Uh, so one of the things that, that I love uh, about this place is that people love this church. And I have experienced the goodness of the church. Um, I've found that when, you know, just go back, back to that, when my mom was, was really sick, like the church was incredible. This mm-hmm. church was unbelievable in writing us notes and and all of these things so there's this reflection of the father in that and what i'm trying to say is that there's an idea of god and you guys talk about tozer i guess you told me that the other day and i've I've been kind of listening to tozer a little bit lately the most important thing about a person is what comes to your mind when you think about god when when i look at god i don't want to just see him as far off I want to see him as the father that he is. And one of my mentors said this a few years ago, and he said, leaders don't like to leave any room left on the table. And I believe powerful churches are the same way. Like powerful churches don't want to leave anything left on the table that God's called them to. They want to take everything that God's called them to in a city. They don't want to leave any thing that God is, and and he said this, at the end of your life, I hope that you leave no thing that God has called you to undone and no gift that your father has for you unopened. Mm. And that's that's about an ever-increasing intimacy with your father. That's That's a different thing. So purpose suddenly becomes like, it's not just where am I going or what am I doing, it's who am I with. And it's knowing the God. I mean, Jesus says to us, he says, like, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's an ever-increasing intimacy with Jesus in purpose. I don't really f- believe that the deepest purpose in your life will ever be found outside of knowing God. So that's, man, that statement, just, just the way you into that, seems like it should be the final statement. Um, is there anything, anything else, um, knowing, knowing God, obviously, utmost importance, um, but, but we also see people who, who lose their identity in, in acts of service or in, uh, it, we've, we've, maybe witness ministers who lose their their selves and maybe their families and everything in ministry. Mm -hmm. Um, So so it's not just about this like tunnel vision of of growing in my knowledge of God, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So what else what else outside that? How would you how would you describe how to how to buffer that with with other important aspects of how you develop into your purpose? Okay, so, so kind of going back to how you welcome other people into your life. Uh, one of our mentors, yeah. mutual, Dave Jewett, yeah. uh, yep. I was talking to, if you haven't hung out with Dave, um, try to hang out with Dave or get his <laughs> materials. Just an amazing man here in, in, in Tulsa. Mm-hmm. And um, this is funny. I, had a, I was at Panera at a 91st and Memorial with, with uh, Jewett one day a few years ago. I, I, was, uh, I think I was, 20, I was 24 and he's taking me through his year one degree. So there's the general purpose, like I am here to glorify God. And then like your particular purpose, like the thing that God sent you here to do. Like just, just real quick, think about this one. Like no one here is an accident. And if we look throughout all of time and space, Psalm 139 would say that like God knit you together in your mother's womb. I want to read you this one because this one may just knock, knock your socks off like it does me. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which also, a sphere which especially includes you. And the NIV says, the sphere of service which God appointed us, the sphere of service which God assigned us. Like, you're not just showing up at work. <laughs> like, you were actually assigned to where you are by God. 
And you were also assigned to this geographic location at this time in history by God. And the purposeful creator placed you here on purpose. And this one, my mentor Wes said, he dropped this one on me today and he said, consider this. God is as purposeful in sending you to this place at this time as he was in sending Jesus to the cross. Unless you're saying that God placed you here on accident today. And if I'm awakened to the reality of who God is and what he's called me to and where I am, then how do I occupy where I am? How do I, if my, if my purpose is to glorify him, then it's about making him look beautiful. I mean, it's second, second mile, second nature, right? I mean, it's it, it like go the, the second mile. It's, it's lonely. <laughs> You're not going to find a lot of company because God's calling for you is greater in that space. It's greater in service. It's greater. Uh, and, and so I would say that. Anyway, back, back to, to Jewett. I, I, uh, so we're, we're at, at Panera. Um, and and um, I wish my tangents were that good. Oh, I, I always bring it back yeah. around. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I always bring it back around. So uh, Jewett is the f- most amazing question asker. Uh, and, and he just was asking me question after question and just kind of unlocking the, the you know, these things. And I was like, whoa, I, I didn't, didn't know I was thinking all this. And I, I said, Dave, how did you become such a good question asker? And he looked at me and he said, why don't you try becoming really interested in people? <laughs> Which is a really nice way to say you're so self-absorbed, like you don't want to ask questions. And so I think having people like who end up really just speaking a lot of truth into you, like who will sharpen you, who will say the hard truth in a loving way. Um, like, you know, maybe you're like me, you kind of have some codependent tendencies and your life is driven though you don't want to say it. If anybody told me like a year ago, they're like, you may be codependent. I'd be like, no. Nah. That's fear-based, or that, that's not me. And then it was like, oh, wow, maybe, maybe I am people-pleasing. I found that the opposite of people-pleasing isn't telling people how it is. The opposite of people-pleasing is love. Because people-pleasing comes from fear. Mm. <laughs> love is saying, I will sometimes say the hard truth, and sometimes I'll give you a little grace right now. Love is patient, and yet it also holds us to it. So... I don't know if, if that totally answers what, what you're saying, but I think you have, hurts. there's no such thing in the Christian life that I know of as the Lone Ranger. Like if you're trying to, to walk in purpose alone, um, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't so, work. So I can go uh, full steam ahead at trying to just understand God, um, but that will be to my detriment if I'm forgetting myself and those around me. Mm. Um, and, and so, I, so what, that's, that, that's what I hear us getting to um, is, is purpose uh, will not ignore our God and purpose will not ignore ourselves and those around us. Um, I'll ask you a couple, so a couple questions that, yeah. that we'll, we'll try not to spend too much time on these sure, so we can get sure. through a, a few here. Um, if someone out here is struggling to understand what their own purpose is, what would be, what would be a paragraph that you would want to say to them? Find your purpose in your pain. Mm. We spend a lot of our life running from it. Um, I met a guy this past year named Sean Askinosi, and uh, he spoke at the TEDx Oklahoma City. And you just go watch his talk about it because his talk is unbelievable about how you find your passion and purpose in your pain. And for him, it was showing up um, at the at at the hospital um, in the essentially what what is hospice in the hospital. And uh, in the palliative care unit. And that's where he found his purpose in life was there. So uh, we have a lot of 
opportunities to numb ourselves to our pain in this culture. Um, but right there where our pain is and what, where our heart breaks, that's also where we'll find our greatest joy and our greatest opportunities to serve people. Love that. Um, think. How, how would you define um, the word hope? Hope is a slippery word. Uh, Harold Schenck said that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Because it's, it's tough to, to get hold of. You know it when it's not there. And yet you also know when it is there. Um, guy handed me a definition of hope two weeks ago. I wish I would have brought those papers in here. I would have said. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I believe that, that hope is it's this, this steadfast belief that good is coming again. That like even in the darkest night, like that the sun will rise again, that good will come again, and that in all of all of the pain and suffering, that like God is still present and He's still with us, and He's still good. Well, and I ask that, and that's that's a really great answer, because uh, I wanted to illuminate again the idea that that it's that we're not aiming at a place, that we're aim we're we're on this journey. And, and purpose as, as elusive and changing sometimes as, as purpose uh, can be, that it's going to go up and down. And when it's going down, it's going to seem like, oh, I'm losing it, I'm losing it. But hope keeps us going. Mm. Hope keeps us going because there, there still is, is deep residing purpose on the journey and God's got more planned ahead. That's so good. God's got more planned ahead. Um, a couple final thoughts, and we'll have a couple final outro questions. Okay. Um, we should not seek our purpose in anything except for God. God doesn't have a purpose for you that is outside how He created you. And the best way to find your purpose is to become deeply interested. This is the quote I was talking about. Dave said this, and he didn't remember saying it. The best way to find your purpose is to become deeply interested in cultivating a work with Him. Let me say that again. The best way to find your purpose is to become deeply interested in cultivating a work with God. Can I just speak about that for a Please. second? Okay, so, so this is a big paradigm shift in, in my life is uh, I believe that the, the people of God are called to do great things for God. Okay, so I want to say that first, like you exist for his glory. But what we've missed a lot of times and, and um, what, what I missed for years until my friend Stephen Ray just opened it up to me, it was like, in, in, in Matthew, Jesus says, I, th I think it's in Matthew, he says, my father is always at work. So that tells me that like in any situation on this planet, because God is everywhere, that he's already at work. So my idea is like, okay, God, like I'm going to go do stuff for you. And Jesus is like, hey, come do stuff with me. I'm like, hey, did you see that? Like we're working on this. And he says, no, I was already there. You're just joining me in what I'm doing. One, one carries a really heavy burden because I'm holding all of it together and I'm making it happen. And if I do all these things, I can come back and show God and he'll be like, all right, well done. You're worthy. But it's so disconnected from the relationship that, that we have and that he's inviting us into. Now, I, th there is something about us, you know, saying here's five talents and here, here are 10 and he's like, great job. But let's not... Let's not miss that he was part of the 10 happening, <laughs> that he is inviting us to join him in what he is doing uh, in the world as he is setting all things to rights. Know your God. Know yourself. Know your struggles. And pay attention because God's still at work. 
Dave, where are you going to be in 10 years? Hopefully eating less fast food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like still kinda, dressing kinda up kinda as a cow up. at, at yeah. Chick-fil-A, hopefully. Hopefully that. Funny thing, I put post-it notes, you know, yellow post-it notes on yesterday. It was pretty, um, pretty much not an effort, um, (laughs) but I still wanted the free chicken. (laughs) Well, sure. Um, So I dressed up like a cow. So those were my were my spots, and um, anyway, I got free chicken Booker. So, um, (laughs) like, (laughs) I think when when I look ten years from from now, um, I would like to say that my heart is more tethered to Jesus, that like I'm walking with him more and more, that I'm trusting in him more than I'm trusting in myself, that my habits of prayer, my habits of study, my habits of service, uh, and my habits of, of trust, instead of carrying worry and anxiety, that it's really just trusting him, um, that that that's what I'm hoping for um, at, at that point. The other thing um, that I just want to say is, I didn't mention this earlier. I feel a little inadequate here, like looking out and seeing like a lot of people who have lived very purposeful lives. I'm like, you should have interviewed them because uh, <laughs> there's so much wisdom in in the room. And so um, I hope that this is you know hoisted some some sails for some of you who are like just so full of purpose right now and. You know, if you've gotten a little lost along the way, um, man, I just believe that, that the Father really wants us to know how much he loves us. Phil Smith said this to me a few years ago, and, and I love this a lot. He said, you know, if you read, read in Ephesians, so this is like in 10 years, if you read it in Ephesians, it says, be filled with the, with, with the Spirit. So when you think of being filled, what do you think of? And I was like, filling a, like a, a cup. And he said, you know, Ephesus is pretty close to, to, to the sea. And when they would talk about being filled, they were probably talking about being like filling a sail. And by that, I mean that God, by his Holy Spirit, is filling us and sending us places. And isn't that beautiful? Like you get to look back 30, 40, 50 years. Maybe look back right now and just see all the things that you've been able to do with the Lord and reflect on that and treasure that. And then just say the one prayer that we know God always answers. I want more of you in my life. Just more of you, more of you, God. So that's what I hope life looks like in a decade. Well, I really had you here tonight because I want to be able to say in 10 years, yeah, the whole world knows who Dave Skidmore is, and I got to interview him. Because <laughs> I, I, think, I think you do a good job of, of embodying a, a journey towards, towards purpose and a journey with purpose, with God leading you. And I'm so excited to see what God has in store for Dave. Thank you. Dave, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Come back next week. Uh, next week will be um, uh, a little bit, a little bit more unique. Uh, I am out of town again. We are going to. I'm going to actually film um, a an interview for you guys to watch next week. Um, but but please please don't let that dissuade you from uh, from coming and experiencing this all together because I think it really will be a story uh, of of God's power of God's might, of God's faithfulness uh, in a journey through a very difficult uh, medical struggle uh, that, that some of our members have gone through. So, so please make an effort to come back and be here next week. Thank you all so much for being here. God bless. You are dismissed.